First of all, Annika, welcome to the Nonfiction Brand Podcast. Well, DP Knuton, thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Well, I wanted to have you on because obviously we met each other fairly recently via the interwebs. And Mm -hmm. one of the things that's really cool about those interwebs is that you don't have to meet everybody and like everybody. But when you have a chance meeting with someone that you actually gel with, it's like, where have you been all my life? And the answer is, well, I've been a couple thousand miles away, you know, or a thousand miles away. But Annika and I met each other and she invited me to uh, speak to her class at the University of Southern California, which was very cool because a lot of people don't know this, but I was a Trojan working towards an MFA in acting. I didn't get that MFA, but I I did get a DNF. I did not finish. However, (laughs) I'm really happy to be talking to Annika. Annika, first of all, You're a professor, an adjunct professor. Is that the title with the University of Southern California? What exactly are you teaching at the Annenberg School? Okay, there's the Annenberg School of Marketing and Communications, but there's also the Annenberg School of PR and Communications or? Communication and we're the School of Communications and Journalism. Oh, okay. The official. official. There you go. Well, anyway. Annika's there and she's teaching graduate level classes in, well, I'm not going to tell you. Annika, take it away. Tell us what you are teaching those lovely master's level people at the University of Spoiled Southern California. (laughs) You know, it's funny because, yes, I think that used to be more appropriate than it is now because now there's so much diversity on campus, which I love. And it's a big push for the university. So I am a part-time professor and I teach in two different master's programs. One is the MS in digital media management. And this semester, I'll be teaching digital content creation for that. And before I've I've taught some other classes for it. And then for the PR and advertising MA, I teach PR and branding this semester. And I've taught a few other classes as well. But I'm also recently the co-host and co-producer of the Mediascape speaker series, which we are turning into a podcast. Of course. Well, you you sure. have to when you've got a property like that and one that has a a brand name like USC associated with it. You have to take advantage of that. Otherwise, you're just leaving that proverbial opportunity on the table. And I certainly recognize the value of that. And I really enjoyed being invited to speak to your class because again, we are just getting to know each other. So, you took a chance on me and I gave you a double barrel of the DP shotgun. And uh, I think it went pretty well. It went really well. And it was perfect timing because we are talking about branding and PR. And the way I approach it with the class is let's develop your personal brands first. As we're also exploring brands out in the world that you might work with in your corporate careers or your entrepreneurship career, whatever you decide to do after you leave USC. But it's really important to know who you are. And so many of us don't know that person until we're much older than my students. So if they even have a little head start on their personal brand and understand how that applies to making them different in the marketplace, gives them their special vov, right? That they have, that they can offer to a future employer, whether it's a brand, an agency, an individual, that is going to help them get so much further ahead. And they're going to understand better how to brand their clients. And I I start with brand first, right? You have to have your brand really dialed in before we can really do a great job on your PR or your social media or your other communication strategies. Oh, amen. I mean, there have been so many minor imbroglios about, well, let's see, Ashton Kutcher and Mila Kunis and all sorts of other people who've stepped in stuff that is absolutely counter to their brand. Like Ashton Kutcher is probably the best example of that right now, where he and Demi Moore, his then wife, started a nonprofit called Thorn that was all about helping trafficked uh, women Mm -hmm. and children and things like that. And then he writes a letter in favor of one of his former castmates from that 70s show, who actually is going away for 30 years for rape. Hmm, not a good brand fit there, Ashton. And the funniest thing is, if if anybody saw the video apology where Mila Kunis was next to Ashton Mm -hmm. Kutcher, you could read her face. And she was like, I knew I shouldn't have done that, Ashton. You told me I I should Mm. do that. And she 
She blamed him, but she also hated herself for doing it because she knew her brand just blew up in not a good way. There is such a thing as bad press, and both oh, yeah. Ashton and Mila are finding that out big time. They're not, they're not the only ones. Uh, and now it's starting to resurface, right, about things that they said when they were younger about, oh, we can't wait till so-and-so turns 18 and is dateable. Talking about other celebrities, other actresses, people who are music, musical artists. But then we also see things with like the writer's strike out here. Drew Barrymore is also stepped in it and is now losing a lot of the credibility that she's gained over the past few years. Because those of us who know Drew Barrymore, we know her as like Little Girl Lost and all the things she did when she was younger and all of the issues she had with substance abuse while she was creating this great career. And then she was kind of this wild, crazy child. And now she is a great show hostess. However, going against the writers and deciding to bring her show has created a lot of ill will towards her. And, you know, it's really interesting to look at celebrity as the barometer of brand and how one little mistake for them, it's a much bigger mistake than you or I could make. We can make a mistake, but it's not going to be as public, especially if we don't share it on social media. But if you're at that level, you really have to evaluate, is this authentically me or not? Well, I- exactly. And if, again, we can point to an example that most people would be aware of. This is several years old, but Colin Kaepernick, when he took the knee in protest at some football games and everything blew up, he got fired. But, and this is the key, but, but Nike embraced him as part of their brand, which, so you got two brands there. You got Colin Kaepernick and you've got Nike. Both brands are very much aligned in one or two key areas. One is performance and leadership, if you will, or being in at the front. Let's say at, they're, they're both at the forefront brands. They are not follower brands. They are leading brands. And so Colin Kaepernick is leading on the Black Lives Matter side of things. And Nike is leading on the, hey, most of our constituency who buys our products are on Colin's side. And we don't mind losing the golf club crowd as much because we know yeah. the young golf club guys are probably along with us anyway. So we're going to lead, we're going to uh, be aligned as two brands going in the same direction to fantastic results. You know, Nike is still around. Colin Kaepernick yeah. isn't playing football, but he's still relevant as a oh, brand yeah. in the marketplace. Exactly. exactly. And part of Nike's ethos is the athlete in all of us, right? They make high performance gear for athletes. They consider if you are a living, breathing human, you're an athlete, right? You might not be performing at a high level as a professional athlete, but you're still going to be walking your dog, going for a run, yoga, whatever you decide to do in your daily life or your once a month or once a week hike with friends, whatever that the case may be, depending on where you live. But they understood that for their brand value, they're looking at everybody, not just as a small elite amount of people. And to really look at the values of the people who are, frankly, also going to buy the drops when a new sneaker drops and it's going to cost several hundred dollars, who is buying that? It's not the elite crowd of golfers or whoever you're thinking of. It's, it's people. Both brands, too, have this streak of rebellion in them because there have been brands that associate with big athletic stars forever. But the stars that Nike chooses to align with always have a little bit of edge to them. Even early days with Tiger Woods, he was absolutely disrupting the game of golf. If you think about it 15 years ago, he literally came on the scene and turned golf on its head in a way that all of a sudden the old white guy image of golf was re-energized by this young guy who could drive like crazy and who just was so thrilling to watch. Now, I could argue that he lost some of his edge when he started to lose his brand when, you know, and every marriage is different. I don't know what was going on with that marriage, but when that marriage broke up, a little bit, his brand was tarnished. Then when he got in that accident, driving a car too fast and stuff, it it was very murky as to what was actually going on, but it was clear that, you know, he was injured physically, But his brand took a huge hit, too, because it's like, are you substance abusing? Are you not? What what was going on? That doesn't seem like the the performer 
that I know. So again, that's another brand that kind of was getting a little bit out of alignment. If you're talking to PR professionals about one, defining their brand as PR professionals so that they can then help create and disseminate and communicate the story of the brands of the people they serve, those are very, very important things to understand that concept of alignment. Do you know what I'm saying? What what I'm saying when I say alignment? Oh, yeah. Well, just yesterday after class, a student came up to me who had really wanted to focus on sports, athletes, celebrities working maybe for, she actually mentioned Nike. So working in that vein and another student, the first day of class, because they all went around and I invited them to bring an object that they felt represented who they were as a brand. And so this one student was like really into sports. The other student said, oh, I would not do sports. There's no money in it. It's just a lot of long hours. So the first student got a little discouraged. And after class yesterday, she came up and said, I've really been thinking about this and struggling because that is who I am. That is what I want to do for a career. And I said, then you have to lean into it. You can't let somebody else get you out of alignment on your goals and what you know you'll be best at. Not only for yourself, because you'll be bringing your whole self to your job, but you'll be able to better represent and work with these brands and these athletes and these celebrities because you're pouring your passion into this. And yeah. so, you know, I think that's a lot of the trouble. People aren't sure who they are. And I, I know this is a huge thing for especially graduate students to be going through because they don't really know who they are yet, but it's what's going to make it different for them when they do look for their jobs. Well, I talked to one of your students afterwards because that Andre guy, Andre Carr, oh, he, yeah. he's unstoppable. He, he sees a door and <laughs> to him, it's like the tape at the end of a race. And he, he runs through the tape. Oh, yeah. Good. And I applaud him for that. But he reached out to me and said, hey, can I talk to you for a few minutes? And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Why not? And he mentioned we were talking about what he wants to do. And it revolves around music. And music, when you say music, it could be music, entertainment, venue management, or artist management, or actually working A&R at a record label There's so many different things you can do there, especially in the PR space, because every musician needs to have a brand that cuts through. Do you know a woman named Anna Lapwood on TikTok? Mm, Okay, bear with me. There are a couple of TikTok people that I would love for every listener to check out and actually follow because they're so instructive. Anna Lapwood is a, I don't know how old she is. I'd say she's around 30, probably a little bit younger than 30. But she is, get this, an, a pipe organist. She ah. plays pipe organs. But she doesn't just play any pipe organs. She plays the, I don't know, 5,000 pipe organ at this venue in London. What is it? Uh, uh, Albert Hall. Wow. And Albert Hall is this beautiful circular venue and everybody's played there. Rock and roll, classical music. I saw, what's her name? Casey Musgraves Mm. recorded a, a whole TV special at Royal Albert Hall in London. But anyway, she just started setting up her camera as she would practice in the middle of the night. Because the reality is, if you're an organist, you can't play on the real organ During the day when everybody's there, you have to come in the middle of the night to do your practicing. So she'd be there at 2 a.m. She would set this up and she would play just everything, ranging from the soundtrack from the movie Interstellar, the Hans Zimmer soundtrack, to, you know, Bach cantatas, you name it. And she would record this and people were like, this is so cool. And then she started sharing what was happening. And there's a, a band that's kind of a... It's not pure EDM, electronic dance music, but it's, it's more, you know, it's, it's kind of driving rhythms and stuff like that, but it, they have live musicians. It's not just purely electronic. They were performing at Royal Albert Hall for several nights, and she was there as they were kind of wrapping up, getting ready for, I think it might have been their last, right before their last night, the night before their last night. And so she was playing all that stuff, and all of a sudden, over her shoulder, you can see the camera, up comes one of the guys from the band, Bonobos. And he says, wow. hey, if we wrote you some music to go wow. with one of our songs, could you play that with us? Wow. And she did that. And the next night, and of course she was recording that or live streaming it even. 
as it happens. And the, the stuff they wrote for her was using all the big, fat pipes that literally rumble almost subsonically. So the whole building shakes. Oh and their finale piece for the final concert she played, mm -hmm. the place went nuts. <laughs> She has parlayed this. And, uh, you know, she's a very pleasant looking person, but she's not model pretty. She's just a regular human being. She plays a pipe organ for crying out loud. <laughs> and she was able to parlay these TikToks into two albums released by Sony Classical, that record label, because mm -hmm. one, she's so flipping popular on TikTok. And it, it's amazing. So there's her, Anna Lapwood, but... There is someone that, especially in the PR space, I love to follow, Molly McPherson. She is a PR professional for crisis communications, and she mm. serves a whole lot of people. But what she does on TikTok is very fast live or briefly recorded reactions to whatever the PR thing of the day is. And anybody interested in PR, you got to follow Molly McPherson because she's so good at at deconstructing what the real problem is. The other thing that I study about her is how she does what she does and how it reflects who she is. That, you know, the, the big trio for nonfiction branding is who you are, what you do, and how you do it. She is a masterclass. She demonstrates her brand in every single video she does. You may not agree with her 100% of the time, but boy, she's always entertaining. Yeah, she's living into her authenticity. And that's something that when you, because I've mostly been, I haven't worked at the big agencies like you have. I've mostly been an independent practitioner, worked in house, you know, worked with small brands or smaller agencies. And one thing that you have to do when you're starting your own company, you don't always, and you should, but if you don't have the customer personas all dialed in, you quickly learn who you can really serve and who you can't and how you can live in your authenticity. And when you get out of that, that's when things start going the wrong way, right? I worked for an agency once that I thought was the right fit and got in there. And after six months realized that our values didn't match. So I had to course correct and I just exited. I just quit. Didn't have a backup plan. <laughs> so, but I knew what I had to do for myself to feel like I was able to serve the clients that I wanted to serve in a way that was meaningful to them and to me. And so it sounds like she's an amazing example of that. Like really, you know, dialing in, she's dialed into who she is. She's going to live in her authenticity. And this is a conversation I've been having a lot with people on the podcast at all levels of success in business is that pinnacle moment when they really realized who they were and what they wanted to do is when everything changed for them and they found success, whatever metric they're measuring it on. It's not always financial, right? Maybe it's they wanted to travel more, spend more time with their kids and have enough money to do that and feel like they were not, the roof wasn't gonna fall in. And I find that for myself too, and I actually just was in a book called Business on Purpose, volume two, and it's about women in business who overcame to find our purposes and how we weave that into our businesses. So anytime that you can do that and Mine goes through my whole kind of life story and how I always knew I was going to be in PR and marketing because I love collaborating and communicating and creating environments where people can be celebratory of whatever it is, right? Whether it's a cause or because they did something great themselves, just let's celebrate each other. And that's our job is creating those moments of celebration and recognition for our clients. But so if you don't have buy-in to who they are and you're brand and your mission doesn't match with who they are, it's not going to be as successful. Oh, you are so right. I mean, one of the things that I'm inspired by, by the generations coming up now, I, you know, millennials and whatever, sub-millennials, whatever we're calling them these days, I'm so inspired by the fact that so many of them will not stay at a job that does not fulfill them. You know, sure, they're going to have to work. Some days are going to be worse than others. But if it's a total mismatch... Boom, I'm going to quiet quit or just plain, you know, Irish exit where I'm just not showing up one day and then emailing saying, hey, can you send me my last paycheck? And they're like, what? You, you quit? Yeah. Why? That didn't feel like working for you. Now that to me being, I'm an older guy, right? We never quit anything without a backup job waiting for us. 
because we were, you know, taught by our parents who lived through world wars or, you know, depressions and stuff like that. So it's a wonderful place to be at when you can realize that, you know, this work doesn't fulfill me. Yeah, I could make as much working as a barista at Starbucks so I can get enough money to go maybe travel abroad for a year. So I think I'll do that. It's like, really? And the answer is, yeah, if you know who you are, what you do and what, how you do it, you get to choose. And one of the things you kind of alluded to in your story there was you aren't wasting your time on the people you cannot serve best. Right. Instead, you can lavish your attention and your passion and your energy on the people who get what you do and appreciate it. Oh, and by the way, are willing to pay for it without bitching about what's on the invoice. Right. Once you can do that, once you feel comfortable with that, all of a sudden your free time is filled up with possibilities to find other people who appreciate you as you are, not as how you think you might need to present yourself. And that's something we live under for so much of our lives is who do, who do we have to show up as for other people? What are their expectations of us? Instead of thinking about, well, what do we expect? this experience. And it makes it a lot easier to say no and to dial down and to take away things and not be the people pleaser. You know, that a lot, especially I think as women, we are, we tend to be the ones who are like going to be the caretakers. You know, I know that's changing a lot, but I still find us falling. We find, we we'll find ourselves falling into those roles so often, but when you're able to dismantle that, right. And to really think about what's going to make me happy and serve me and make me better, whether it's for my family. I mean, we both have daughters, we both have kids for our families and how, how we show up every day. And I see that example, like my daughter is in high school and the science department was getting rid of a lot of textbooks. So she immediately went, she found some books that she wanted to take home because she is going to be a scientist. She's, that's who she is. And I'm honoring who she is. And I love that she already knows her brand at such a young age because I certainly didn't. But she also knows my brand really well. So she asked, well, what's going to happen with the rest of the books after teachers or students want to take them? And these are old textbooks. Nobody wanted them. So she said, mom, can we use them for one of your charities? I was like, of course. So I love that she knew she knows herself so well at 15, but she also knows me so well that she knows that I would want to repurpose those books for one of the nonprofits that we're involved in, because those books might not be good for her school, but they'll be great for other students whether it's in another country or in other parts of the United States that might not have access to those kind of textbooks. Of course, you don't want to be mercenary about things like the charities or the nonprofits that you work with or give to. But if you were looking to hire someone to work with you, because small team work closely together, you might tell that story to say, this is what we do on top of the things. You know, it's important for us And the thing is, you aren't writing a check to get 50,000 new books for somebody. You're like, no, can we stop by with a car and pick these up and then take them someplace? Yeah. That's showing exactly what you would expect of an employee of your company, because here's the reality. If you have a company with your name on the door or you're the founder or the CEO of it, the DNA of that company is your DNA. Until you are no longer with the company and whoever bought that company and didn't keep you with it, they just bought, you know, a shell with no heart. Yeah. Wow. That's fascinating. So what is the number one concern that you find your students are most concerned about when it comes to what you're teaching at USC? Mm. I think one of the things that they're most concerned about is a couple of them know what they want to do for work. A couple of them have very strong ideas for companies that they want to start, but most of them need an outside observer. And I think because I work in this area for my day job, right, as well, it makes it a little easier. So I'll be able to, I'll be talking to a student. They'll say, well, I don't really know how to distill my values and who I am into positioning statement. And I'll say, okay, let's talk through this. And they'll start telling me what their values are. They'll tell me like how other people have We did a lot of the exercises that you mentioned in class, right? Like ask a friend, ask your parent, like ask people around you what they think of you. What are words that come to mind when they think about who you are as a person? And then I'm able to say, okay, here's what it is. Here's who you are. And here's how it plays into what you want to do and what what you said were your purpose and vision and mission for your personal brand. 
And so I think they have a fear of saying who they are, of, of leaning into that, or they feel like they don't know themselves well enough. When in truth, it's right there. They do know. They just need somebody else to give them, help them, guide them, I guess, to that aha moment where then they can say, okay, yeah. And then they can lean into who they are. And again, it's not easy. It's something that we go back. I, I know I've always kind of known who I am, but I also have had a lot of times where I felt other, or I felt like, oh, I need to be this kind of person for this role or this job or this thing that I'm doing. And it's taken a long time to get to the point where I'm now saying, no, this is who I am. This is who I can deliver my best work to. So going back to that conversation, if we can get them to do that now, even if we can get younger people to do that now and, and really figure out the essence of themselves, that's going to create a richer world for all of us, a world where we get to have these authentic experiences where we're, we all want to buy brands, I think, that we can see who they are and what their values are, and we can feel attuned to them. So how lovely would that be if with these younger generations, they're already, that's just who they are and how they live every day. Think about what that's going to change, how that's going to change things in five years, 10 years, a couple decades from now. Yeah, I agree with you. And I want to talk more about that next week, but we're kind of at the end of this episode of the Nonfiction Brand Podcast. And I want to remind people that every edition of this podcast is brought to you by this bad boy, a book called Nonfiction Brand, Discover, Craft, and Communicate the Completely True, Completely You Brand You Already Are, written by a guy named D.P. Knuton. It's available at Amazon.com. Go check it out. And if you get a copy, let me know what you think. I certainly would like that. I also want people to know where they can learn more or get in touch with you, Annika. W yeah. Where do you hang out most online in the old internets? On the old interwebs, I have all the socials, Amplify with Annika, your brand Amplified. But LinkedIn is probably the best way to get a hold of me. And it's probably where I post the most original content um, with everything that we do, podcasting, teaching, working at an agency, it's hard to, to manage to be on all the socials all the time. And then to reach out to me at LinkedIn or fullcapacitymarketing.com, you can learn more about all the different things that we do and you can hit the contact button to schedule a call. That sounds great. And for listeners on the podcast, you should know that Annika is spelled A-N-I-K-A -A, and Jackson is spelled exactly the way you'd think it should be. <laughs> J-A-C-K-S-O-N. And I, of course, am your host, D.P. Knuton. And she is... Annika Jackson. And we'll be back next week with more about nonfiction branding and getting your brand and amplifying it the Annika Jackson way. Talk to you next week. Bye-bye.